Now, live from Whitney Media, 1460 WVOX, the Greenberg Report, with Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. You can join in the conversation at 914-636-0110. Now, on 1460 WVOX, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Good morning. My name is Paul Feiner. I'm the Greenberg Town Supervisor. And today, we're going to not talk about politics. We're going to talk about music. And my guest is Sam Faraci. And Sam is with the Harrison School of Music. And um, you don't have to live in Harrison to uh, take music lessons. Um, They cover a large percentage of Westchester County, including uh, students from from Greenberg. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the school, but also we're going to try giving you tips on what you should do if your child is interested in taking up music. Um, so, Sam, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Paul. Happy to be here today. Good. You know, I come from a musical family. My sister graduated Juilliard, and my niece is with the Phil- Philadelphia Ballet uh, and is a classical um, pianist. Could you just tell us maybe just to start a little bit about yourself and about the Harrison School of Music? Yeah, I opened the Harrison School of Music in January of 2011. Uh really just came out of my love for music and wanting to give back to the community. Uh, Music is such a great thing for bringing community together. And I wanted to create opportunities for children to learn music and really do something with it and be social and really get even more out of music lessons than just what music lessons offer on the the forefront. There's so many studies that show uh, what music lessons help brain-wise, developmentally, and I wanted uh, to offer that to the community. and did you uh, graduate from a music school? I did. I have a bachelor's in music education from Providence College in Rhode Island and a master's of music uh, from the University of Miami. Ah, that's, yes. yeah, that's great. What, how old were you when you took up music? I was seven when I started. I was inspired by my dad, who also plays piano. Wow. Um, I uh, briefly studied under Stan Getz, the saxophone, but my mother um, and father, they made me uh, practice every day. And um, they didn't make my sister practice, and that turned me off to uh, uh, music when I was, I mean, or performing the saxophone because I was forced to practice an hour a day. Um, is that, did they make a mistake uh, forcing their child, you know, to practice every single day? Or if you're a parent, are you better off, um, you know, being a little easy going? That's a great question, and we get that a lot. Uh, we really find that students learn at their own pace. Some students will come around to practicing later on, and some will decide, hey, I like doing this every day. We generally recommend, you know, sitting for an hour when you're seven years old, that's a long time. But if you can go down and practice for three minutes several times a day, that repetition is really what uh, solidifies that learning. And what about when somebody's a little older, like in junior high school? How, how much time should they be practicing? Absolutely. Well, if they want to go to college for music and that's their goal, then they need to practice a lot and put in a lot of work. If they want to play for fun, they can do it at their leisure. Uh, we often equate it to if you play golf, if you miss golf, you know, going out on the course for one or two weeks, you're not going to throw your clubs in the lake and be like, ah, I'm done with it. You're going to say, you know, when the time is right, I'm going to get back to that and keep up my game. Same thing with music. Just because you miss a little bit of practice doesn't mean you should give up. Just when the time is right, you get back to it and continue on where you left off is it if i was like in a stage band when i was in um, high school but i really haven't played the saxophone for probably you know for many years like 20 30 years so i probably i just remember bag fed um and i'm sort of wondering how long would it take somebody to you know learn the instrument if they've been out of it for 20 or 30 years. You know, we also get that a lot. We have a lot of adult students who come to us after playing when they were younger and say, hey, now I have time. I want to study. I want to get back into it. And they love music. And it's a little bit like riding a bike. You know, those fundamentals that you retained from when you were younger will start to come back. And you just, again, pick up from where you left off and the teacher will guide you. You might have to take a few steps back, get those fingers moving again. Or if you're doing vocal lessons, getting your vocal muscles warmed up again. Uh, 
but it's definitely something you can always do. What, what uh, made you choose uh, Harrison as the location for your business? Yeah, I found it was a location that didn't have uh, much in terms of a music school. Uh, there were some private teachers uh, that were well-known in the area going house to house. And uh, private teachers in home are great, but the benefit of a community music school is students get excited about seeing other students learning music just like them. They can watch others progress. They can help each other, especially when we have our recitals. They're big all-day events. Uh, we actually have one tomorrow. Um, we have about 200 students performing tomorrow, and it's great for them to see how everyone is progressing. And when you have uh, in-home teachers, it's not so much uh, as big of a community. Right. We have to take a break, and I want to let people know um, that my guest is Sam Ferracci, the Harrison School of Music, and you also wrote a book, The Definitive Guide to Music Lessons, Everything You Need to Know About Learning a New Instrument. And how do people get the book? Sure. We have it available at the school office. They can give us a call and get it, or it's also available on Amazon.com. That is fantastic. I'm Paul Feiner, Greenberg Town Supervisor, and we'll be right back with Sam Ferracci. Um, and he wrote a book, The Definitive Guide to uh, Music Lessons. I'm Paul Feiner. See you in a few minutes. Now, back to the Greenberg Report on 1460 WVOX. Once again, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Hi, I'm Paul Feiner. I'm the Greenberg uh, Town Supervisor. And my guest is Sam um, uh, uh, Sam uh, Ferici. And he wrote a book, The Definitive Guide to Music Lessons. And he also owns Harrison uh, School of Music. And how many students do you have? Yeah, so uh, we actually have two schools. We have the Harrison School of Music, and we have another one over in Rockland County, the New City School of Music. And we have an active enrollment of over 700 students currently. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that must definitely keep you busy. Very busy, Paul. Great. Um, why are um, music um, lessons good for um, students, even if they have no intent of going into music as a career? Uh, yeah, so music lessons, there's so many studies that show that uh, you know, on the basics, it improves math scores um, and reading, but more importantly, it teaches fundamentals, uh, such as, you know, if you're going to a recital, getting up in front of people and getting over, overcoming that fear of, getting, of speaking on stage, as well as um, persistence, learning at your own pace, something could be difficult, but working through it, and frustration tolerance. You know, so many people get frustrated with the littlest things, and in music, that's a daily thing, and we have to learn how to work through those really difficult measures and get our voice or our fingers to do what we want them to do. Right, and I guess um, learning, um, feeling good about yourself, because you see the results of your, your hard work. 100%. Um, and to, what if um, somebody can't sing? Uh, should they just give up in terms of trying out for a chorus? I guess it would depend on the chorus. If you're joining a community chorus, it's open to all members. Having some knowledge versus no knowledge is going to be a huge step. And, um, you know, what do people do if they audition and then they reject it? Is that like a downer and could it create uh, personality problems for them where they feel bad about themselves? I guess it could. Um, what we really like to think happens and what has happened myself is if we've been rejected from an audition if we get results back on what we could work on and we just view it as okay these are what i need to improve on and that's okay i don't have to be perfect now i can work towards it at a later time right and i guess um that's part of life you have to learn um from your failures and sometimes failures make you more successful in the, in the long term that's absolutely correct that is um great um in terms of um you know, your music school. Um, how do you find uh, the teachers? Sure. So a lot of it at this point comes from word of mouth. Teachers refer their other friends and colleagues um, that they've gone to school with or in the area. Uh, we have a really great program from top down. We try to take care of our office team, all of our teachers, down to our students, and then our parents. And we find when everybody's happy at all those levels, it just creates a fantastic program for everyone involved. Do you uh, also uh, perform, you know, yourself? I do perform. Um, most recently, uh, we took some about 30 students to New Orleans to perform. 
uh, back in April, and I performed as part of the teacher band backing up our students, which was a lot of fun. What instruments do you play? I play piano and a little bit of guitar. Um, you know, one of the, I, I remember when my niece um, graduated uh, from New England Conservatory of Music, um, and she's a classical pianist. You know, it's really very hard for people to get jobs. And I mean, she was lucky she's a classical pianist at the Philadelphia Ballet. And previously she did some work with the Boston Ballet. But um, especially if you're in the classical piano field, the odds of getting a really good job are, are slim. So what do people do with their careers? Yeah, so when we do have several, uh, several students that have gone on to careers in music or they're studying uh, music in college. And what we generally recommend is if they're going to pursue music, as you said, being a performer is a very uh, cutthroat business. It's, it's difficult. Uh, so we kind of recommend, you know, go into music to teach or have a minor in music where you still get to uh, work on your skills and enjoy music. It's a little bit easier to get into the uh, audition program when you're going to be a minor as opposed to if you're going to be a major. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's sort of interesting because um, my, I have another niece, uh, I'm talking about all my nieces, um, who just was, uh, she just gave birth to a, um, a two-month-old. Uh, when uh, would be the right age to start music lessons? Yeah, great and how question. These, how old is the youngest uh, student you have? At our school, we start as young as four years old. Uh, you know, music from you know, parents can even sing to their children, and they're gonna. Children will pick up the rhythms and the vocaling, uh, the vocalizing. Uh, my own son, actually, he's eleven now, and when he was little, I would constantly sing to him and tap the beat on him as I was rocking him. And he actually has a uh, perfect pitch, believe it or not. So it's a skill he's been working on and using it for piano, uh, which is very rare. And I'd like to think that because I sang to him and uh, and tapped rhythms to him, that it really helped that from a very early age. Wow, that's uh, and um, and do you think he has any? Is there any possibility that he'll um, run one of your franchises? Ah, uh, we'll see. It's a possibility for sure. That, um, in terms of um, choosing a teacher, um, you wrote a chapter in your book about um, about choosing a teacher. So what's great about taking music lessons with us is we have multiple music teachers for every single instrument. Uh, we have teachers who have jazz backgrounds, we have teachers who have pop backgrounds, we have teachers who have classical backgrounds. So whatever it is that you want to study, we have the right teacher for it. And with the music school, you can come to the same place every week, and if you find, hey, you know, I'm just not gelling with this teacher, we've got another teacher who teaches the same instrument and can teach you a different style, look at the music a different way, and really teach you the music you want to learn. How will, um, you know, like, a, you know, artificial intelligence impact uh, your school and also the whole field of music? That's a great question. It's definitely early on to uh, make a prediction. Um, but I think nothing beats making music together with another human being and feeding off that person and feeling the, uh, feeling the music, which I'm not sure computers can do yet. Right. Although, uh, it, you, know, you never know. You never know. Um, Paul McCartney, I think, is doing using artificial intelligence uh, to create an album with uh, John Lennon. That's very that was interesting. Just, that was just in, in the uh, paper a few days ago. Um, when people, what are some of the, if you were a parent and you're thinking about going to a school or looking at a school, what are some of the um, um, concern, what, what should people be looking for? So when you're looking for a music school, you want to look for a school that you know is the biggest in the area. Nobody wants to go to a restaurant that's empty all the time. They want to go to the busy restaurant, right? And so you know we are the, unless there's a long line. Unless there's a long line, yeah. um, but you know we are a large school. Um, you know, and we have plenty of testimonials uh, about all the great things that we've done uh, for our students and where they've gone on to with music careers or just in life because of their music lessons. They also want to look for a school that doesn't have a long-term commitment. I always think it's a little odd if. You know, why is this place locking you in for such a long time? We are just a month-to-month -month program, so you just pay a month at a time. And if your child decides, hey, I'm not really into music anymore, we don't want to have to force them to keep coming every week to do something they don't like. So, like some schools will say, oh, you have to sign up for a year. Yes. And then after three, four months, uh, the student may lose interest, and then you never... 
you're, you're still paying the tuition. Correct. You know, my I have two kids myself. I'm a dad, and we all know that kids' interests can change weekly, daily, monthly, um, and all of that. So we try to really cater to the students so they don't have a hatred for music, like, oh, I was forced to go. They can come and say, hey, you know, I really want to take up, you know, either another instrument. They can switch at any time with us. Or if they say, hey, I'm really into basketball, I need to take some time off of music to study basketball. And that's totally fine. Is it expensive, you know, the learning an instrument? Uh, you know, we are a mid-range uh, for the area. There are schools that are definitely more expensive than us and uh, schools that are less expensive than us. But we have a great deal right now for summer because we want to help get kids off of devices and engaging their brains for the summer. Uh, parents can get music lessons all summer long. That's weekly lessons for $399. Oh, that's so. How many lessons is that? That'd be eight lessons all summer. So that's so once, a, once a week. So, what's the going rate for like during the regular year? Yep. So, our lessons are sixty dollars per half hour. Right, and it's uh when when I started, it was sixty dollars for uh for uh, probably the whole year. <laughs> Times have changed. It definitely has. Um, it definitely has. Um. You know, it has changed. You know, um, one thing I think about that, Paul, is, you know, some people say, oh, wow, that's expensive. But the, I think a better question is, why are the other places not as expensive? What costs are they cutting? For us, you know, we do background checks on all of our teachers. We have a camera system so uh, parents can watch their kids from the reception room. We have an open door policy. You know, we have staff there all the time to make sure everything is going safe. We offer wonderful recitals twice a year that are absolutely free of charge. We have an achievement program where students get rewarded for everything that they're doing at the school and for their learning. What, so, what type of achievement awards do you give? Sure, so uh, recently we've been handing out uh, trophies and wristbands to our students uh, for reaching different musical milestones. They take tests every couple of months and um, their teacher grades them on where they are and what they're doing and then students get rewarded every few months by receiving a trophy. Oh, that's great. Is that a, a big incentive for students, do you think? It is. is. A, it's a huge incentive and there's nothing like a student coming out of their lesson, getting this huge trophy and walking into their parents' car saying, look what I got today. And that right there helps with the uh, teacher, student, and parent communication. Because now the parent knows, hey, my child learned something today. Look what they earned. Because we all know when kids get in the car, the parents ask, oh, how was lesson today? A seven-year-old is going to say, fine, <laughs> which is totally you know, acceptable for where they are developmentally. They're not going to rehash the entire lesson. It was fine. Right. <laughs> Good. We have to take another break and we'll be right back. And my guest is um, Sam Faraci, and he wrote a book, The Definitive Guide to Music Lessons, Everything You Need to Know About Learning a New Instrument. And how do you get the book? Uh, they can stop by the school and pick up a copy. They can call us or they can get it on Amazon.com. And do you have a website, your school? We do. The music school is www.harrisonmusicschool.com. Great. I'm Paul Fine, Greenberg Town Supervisor. We'll be right back. Back to the Greenberg Report on 1460 WVOX. Once again, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Good morning, uh, Westchester. I'm Paul Feiner. I'm the Greenberg Town Supervisor. My guest is Sam Faraci, and he has um, a music school, um, the Harrison School of Music, and has a lot of experience um, training students to become the next um, Stan Getz or uh, uh, famous uh, musician, um, and uh, he also wrote a book, uh, The Definitive Guide to Music Lessons, Everything You Need to Know About Learning a New Instrument. What made you decide to write the book? As a parent myself, we're always, and my, my wife, we're always looking for uh, new activities for our children, something else from the try and just be well-rounded. And so many times we get into something thinking, oh, what is this going to entail? Is our child ready? Uh, for example, my daughter is in dance classes, and we had no idea what was involved when she would get involved in dance with all the rehearsals and performances. Um, and so I thought it'd be great for parents to know, hey, you know, this is what music lessons are all about. Here's how you can help your child, even if you're not musical, and, you know, how easy it is to get signed up for lessons and just roll with lessons week to week. You know, one of the uh, questions I had is, how do you decide what instrument 
um, a student should take up. You know, when I was um, a student, I took up this alto saxophone because my father played the alto saxophone. Um, my sister took up the piano because my mother uh, uh, knew piano lessons. What's the best approach? But, you know, a lot of kids, when they're especially when they're younger, they want to take up the drums. Yep, for sure. So, I, you know, just like you, Paul, I took up piano because my dad plays piano. I was exposed to it. So I think the best thing parents can do is if they are musical, play the instrument around the house so their child can hear it, or just play music at home on the radio, on a CD, on, you know, whatever device you're using these days. Um, and children would naturally be drawn to what sticks out to them. Um, if, regarding drum lessons, you know, you know your child is ready for drum lessons when they're walking around the house, banging on the pots and pans yeah. and on the couch, right? And you want to channel that positive energy into lessons. So, you know, that's your sign right there. Or if they're singing along in the car to their favorite song. Uh, we recently got my daughter involved with voice lessons because she is constantly singing every Disney song, everything she hears on the radio. And they kind of show natural affinity towards what they like. That is um, that is great. Um, so your music school has basically teachers all different types? We offer all instruments, piano, guitar, drums, violin, voice, uh, saxophone, you name it, we got it. And you said you have 700 students, so you must be doing something right. We do. You know, we attribute that to, like I said, we try to be the happiest music school on earth. We try to keep our teachers happy, our students happy, and when that's happy, parents are happy. Are most of the teachers just locals? Uh, we have quite a few teachers that come out of New York City to teach with us. They are uh, fantastic performers. They are in the jazz scenes, in the classical scenes, in the city. Um, they perform very regularly. How would you recommend, what would you recommend for um, a parent? How do they choose a teacher? What, you know, what's the most important qualities? Yeah, when you contact our office team to find out more about lessons, the first thing we'll do is ask you about your child and what kind of music they like. Do they like rock music? Do they like classical music? And since we have so many teachers with so many different backgrounds, we will pair them up with a teacher that can teach them the kind of music that they want to learn to make it the most fun. And, um, you know, should the teachers have a degree? I mean, is how important is that? That's, you know, that's a great question. The majority of our teachers do have degrees. They've studied music at the college level, gone on to master's degrees. Um, but, you know, some of our rock teachers, you know, there are no rock programs in the at the college level. There's a few, maybe Berkeley College of Music. Um, but, you know, they're going to read and play Metallica by tab or by ear. And if a student wants to learn that, that's where what they need to do. Great. Another issue that comes up is should parents buy or rent uh, their instrument? So you never need to buy an instrument. Definitely don't buy it before the first lesson because the teacher will make a recommendation as to what you need. Um, you know, getting voice is free. You don't have to actually buy an instrument for that. Right. You don't have to uh, rent your voice. <laughs> right. Uh, guitars, we recommend smaller students start with a half size guitar with nylon strings. It's easier on the fingers and that can be purchased for $99. If the family doesn't have a piano at home, they can go to a place like Costco or Sam's Club and get a little keyboard for $100. So it's really inexpensive to get started without a huge investment. Um, you know, but the long-term benefits because of that starter instrument are going to be great. Even with drums, they don't have to buy a full drum set to get started. They can get a small uh, drum pad, it's called. It's about the size of a dinner plate, just to get the rudiments down and just learn how to keep beat and move their hands. Right. Um, one of the issues um, is um, how do you keep your child... Uh, interested you know what happens if you know your child's taking lessons and then says you know i really i'm not that interested or maybe they think somebody else is better and they lose interest yeah so that all has to come down to a conversation with the teacher um, i think parent teacher communication is critical when students are going through that uh, because it could be just a matter of are they not practicing enough? Because the more you practice, the better you get, the better you get, the more fun it is, and then the more you want to practice, and it's a great cycle. So finding the music that the student wants to learn is uh, critical. And also talking with the parent, hey, you know, what's going on at home? Is the instrument out in an open area, or is it tucked away in the back of a closet, and the student has to go through, you know, all these clothes to find their instrument every time they want to practice, or is the piano up in their bedroom? You know, it needs to be out in the open so students can easily grab it, and it reminds them to practice. And so they can also show off to their parents what it is they're learning, because that's a very motivating playing for others. Do you have a lot of students who change instruments in the middle of their classes? 
Uh, we do. We have several students who take multiple instruments a week. They take guitar and voice or piano and voice. Uh, as you know, piano and voice, guitar and voice go very well together. You can think of many you know, famous musicians that play and sing. Uh, but yeah, occasionally students will say, hey, you know, I was enjoying piano, but I'm really interested in drums. And with the music school, that's fantastic. We can make that switch, you know, the following week for you. That is, uh, that, you know, that is great. Uh, what about um, performing with uh, others? You know, when in your school, how old uh, do you have to be to have your first concert? So we, uh, for our recitals, we open them up to students of all ages. Uh, they can be absolute beginners because just that experience of being on stage is so important from an early age to get over that fear and realize, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, playing with others, as soon as you can keep a, a little bit of a beat and stay in time with the other musicians, you're ready to start playing with them. Right. Um, so... Do you have any uh, summer concerts planned? We do. We have uh, recitals this coming weekend. And um, the big thing that we have planned is next summer we are performing at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Uh, and are those for only like the elite musicians? So for this one, every year we do a destination recital. We performed at Carnegie Hall in 2019. Uh, we played at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. We played at Elvis's home in Graceland. Uh, this past April was in New Orleans, the home of jazz. And so this time, we're uh, next year, we're going to Kennedy Center. And for that, we are doing auditions because um, that'll be more of a classical concert. And auditions are a big part of the classical world. And we want our students to experience uh, everything of that entails. And the parents must be so proud if, uh, if their kids um, are playing at Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center or the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a, a wonderful thing for the students. You know, we have students, you know, who as young as eight, on their resume say, I made my Carnegie Hall debut. And that's a big thing. And they get to tell all of their friends, hey, we have this huge performance. My child is performing at Kennedy Center, at Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And it's just a huge, huge um, boost for the students. And when they say, hey, you have an upcoming performance at the Kennedy Center, you can better believe they're going to be practicing. You formed um, your business in 2011. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if any of your graduates are music professional musicians. So what's interesting, some of our earliest students from 2011 are now applying to be teachers with us. So they have gone on to become musicians. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Um, any um, of your former students uh, gone on and become pro like professional musicians at Broadway or uh, uh, Carnegie or the Philharmonic or anything? Uh, not that I know of yet. Um, you know, we've been open 12 years, so those students are just, you know, if they started with us and they were 10, they'd be about 22, 23 now. Um, so some of them we have lost contact with, but, you know, occasionally we do get a nice letter saying, hey, you know, it was because of what we learned with you guys all those years ago, you know, I've now made a career out of music. That is very, very interesting. Um, you, in your book, you talk about details, uh, you know, about piano lessons, guitar lessons, voice lessons, uh, drum lessons. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so piano lessons, you know, as I mentioned before, it's all about learning the music you want to learn. You come to us, and the first lesson is not going to be a lot of playing. It's going to be about the teacher getting to know the student and what their likes are. And students might even talk about, hey, I have a dog and a cat at home, and I really like dogs and cats. And that's okay, because they're forming a relationship you know, to build off of. Many times we have parents who want to come in just for one trial lesson, uh, which we actually don't offer because that first lesson is just getting to know the, the teacher and the student. It really takes a couple of lessons to get to know that. And I think it's important for parents to realize that. Uh, for example, when my son started swimming lessons, you know, he got in the water that first day and he thought it was cold and he said, I'm never swimming again. Well, later on, he went on to be on the swim team because we kept at it for a little bit. And he enjoyed it, and he became really good at it. So with anything you're learning new, one time isn't enough. So we really try to hammer that home with parents that, hey, give this, you know, that's why we're just a month-to-month -month school. Give it a month. That's a good shot to know if your child's going to like that. And we go from there. You know, if your school has um, um, a music class, mm -hmm. um, would, some or some would some parents say, you know, why do I have to send my kids to school? They're already taking music. Yeah, so we have a lot of students who come to us uh, who are maybe in the school orchestra and they're looking to better themselves, trying to be first chair or get a leg up on uh, the upcoming school year. Right, we have to take one final break and I'm Paul Fine, Greenberg uh, Town Supervisor with um, Sam for 
uh, Farachi and his book, uh, The Definitive Guide to Music Lessons, Everything You Need to Know About Learning a New Instrument. I'm Paul Feiner, Greenberg Town Supervisor, and you can get the book on Amazon. Are they, are they also, is a book available at uh, any of the local bu- bookstores? It's not in bookstores, but we do have it available at the front desk of the school. Great. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Now, back to the Greenberg Report on 1460 WVOX. Once again, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Hi, I'm Paul Feiner. I'm uh, the Greenberg Town Supervisor, and um, welcome to our show. My guest is Sam uh, Farachi, and um, he um, owns the Harrison um, Music uh, School. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the address there? Sure, the address for the Harrison School of Music is 253 Halstead Avenue in Harrison. And the website? www.harrisonmusicschool.com. And would you recommend that they go to the school, um, give their kids um, a chance to learn music or an instrument first, or would they would it make more sense to uh, buy your book first and then they read it and then they decide if uh, the kids should have lessons? Yeah, you know, we love having students come, or prospective uh, students come by. So they can take a tour of the school, see what we're all about. We can give them information. We'll even give them a free copy of the book if they wish. Um, you know, and I think getting started sooner than later is better because uh, the longer you wait, you know, you're just missing out on all that opportunity that you could be learning. So, I bet you this book is something that the parents really appreciate because it answers a lot of questions and it seems like it's very easy reading. It is. It's a very easy read. It's written from a parent perspective on how to help best help their child. And, you know, these, these books actually fly off the, the shelf at the school because parents love it so much. Even our teachers have read it. And, you know, it's great. To, they've said it's great to see in words what they've been thinking or feeling all these years and how parents can best help their children. That, that, is, uh, that is great. How would you recommend that parents measure the progress? You know, you're paying, um, you know, money for the lessons and sometimes the kids don't really communicate that well with their parents and tell them exactly what they're doing. So yeah, measuring progress. Every parent wants to know, how is my child doing? Are they learning anything? Um, something we hear sometimes is, Hey, if my child isn't practicing, I don't want to pay for this anymore. And you know, everyone learns at their own pace. Nobody learns instantly overnight. Uh, first couple of lessons are just going to be learning the layout of the instrument, where to put your fingers and some proper techniques so you don't form bad habits later on. And it's one of those things where you could be playing for a while and maybe there's not a lot of upfront progress, but then suddenly there's a breakthrough and you see all that has been gained. So asking students to perform little concerts for you at home and say, hey, what have you been working on? I'd love to hear you and showing interest uh, will show uh, parents, hey, oh, my child is learning something. And the big one, of course, is the recitals. We hold them twice a year. They're 100% free for our, our students and their families. They invite as many friends as they like. It's open to the public. And parents really get to see their child progress, you know, every six months at our big recitals. Um, and ter- you, what happens if, like, a student is just not motivated at all? Do you ever tell, like, the parent, I just want to let you know, you're really wasting your money and it, it's not for them? So we have are... you have that? We do, absolutely. You know, I'm not going to... Try to hide behind that. We definitely have um, some students that just, you know, never practice. And uh, we're just very honest with them and say, hey, you know what? Right now might not be the best time. You know, lessons can be expensive and we don't want to see you waste waste any of that. So, you know, why don't you take a little break? Come back maybe in six months, a year. And, you know, we can try this again. You know, maybe your child will be more interested. Um, Because, again, we don't want to waste anybody's time or money. You know, uh, we're not like a a big conglomerate. It's like greedy. You know, we actually do care about all of our students and want to tell them, hey, you know, this isn't the right time for your student. Let's try again. Take a little break and come back when you're ready. In your book, you have um, a chapter on the one teacher trap. Mm -hmm. And could you tell me what that's about? Yeah, so this is a big one. So musicians, you know, the course of their lifetime and their studies have multiple teachers. Uh, Just as when we're in middle school or high school, you know, we have a different math teacher every year and those teachers teach us different skill sets. And, you know, there's definitely a bond that happens between a music teacher and a music student. They see each other every week. They, you know, talk. They know what's going on in each other's lives. They make music together. It's a lot of fun. 
But, you know, we're all human, and occasionally we have teachers who need to move elsewhere. Um, they get married, or something happens, a life event, and they need to leave the school. So, you know, we'll provide a replacement instructor, and some students feel like, hey, you know what, that teacher was great. It's the only one I could have ever studied with. I don't want anybody else. When in reality, a new teacher offers a fresh perspective and can actually help that student move further along because now they're getting a different side of things. Uh, one example we had years ago is we had an older student who came in for a drum lesson and his regular teacher, I think, was sick that day. And so we had provided a substitute. And funny story, the older student uh, kind of had a little bit of a meltdown in our lobby and went home and wrote us an email saying, I know I should have been notified that there is a, a different instructor that day. This isn't fair. And what he didn't realize is the substitute teacher we had arranged that day was actually the teacher and mentor of his teacher. So this guy had more experience teaching, more experience performing, and had this gentleman just been open to the idea of a different instructor that day, I'm sure he would have gotten something out of that lesson. That is uh, <laughs> really um, amazing. Um, in terms of um, you know, parents, uh, you have a chapter called The Parent Freak Out. If they're not practicing, I'm not paying. Mm -hmm. So have you had parents who said, sorry, I'm not going to uh, pay the tuition? Uh, yeah, we do have parents who get very concerned if they feel like their child isn't practicing. Um, but, you know, we have to remember, just like adults, our lives get busy and children's lives get busy, especially if they have tests at school, they have graduations, they have scouts, they have dance recitals. You know, their attention needs to go elsewhere. It's difficult for anyone to focus on any, you know, on all things all the time. And unfortunately, if they have to say, hey, I need to put music on the back burner for a few weeks so I can focus on this other thing, that's okay. My analogy before of golfing, if you can't make it out to the golf course for two weeks, three weeks, you're not going to throw your clubs in the lake and say, well, that's it, I'm done. The time just doesn't allow for it. So what happens if somebody says, I'm not paying? <laughs> that must be a tough, is that one of your hardest well, uh, uh, aspects of running a business? It's rare, you know, a uh, business owner, you know, we definitely have to deal with some of that sometimes. And, you know, it is a service and our teachers are top notch and we pay our teachers well, you know, the best teachers get the best pay. And unfortunately, if somebody decides, hey, you know, I'm not going to pay for lessons, we do have to remove them from the schedule. But I will say um, your other co-host who's here sometimes, Pauline, has set up a scholarship at the school. So sometimes we have families that go through unfortunate life circumstance. Perhaps they've uh, their house burned down or something like that and money has suddenly gotten tight. They have other needs they need to take care of. So the purpose of that scholarship is for students through no fault of their own or having some sort of difficulty to help keep normalcy in their lives. And it is by application. It does go through Pauline and uh, it keeps the lessons going so the students can continue something they love while they're going through a difficult time. Yeah, that is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Pauline is a member of our zoning board in, um, in, you know, in Greenberg and really just very, very dedicated uh, to um, to helping people. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that um, she's uh, doing a scholarship uh, program. What, uh, so if, what if somebody's not a student, but uh, you know, they come from a, a low income background, uh, would they be eligible for scholarships also? Or is it mainly for students who already are enrolled who have circumstances? And obviously uh, you can't give money to everybody. Right, so the way the scholarship is designed is for students who are currently enrolled that have gone through uh, some sort of mishap in their life, you know, parent lost their job or something, you know, the um, finances have become a burden. So the students can continue something, um, you know, that resembles some normalcy for them. So people uh, really probably appreciate that. What about um, homeschooling? And, you know, what's the, is there an advantage of homeschooling over a music school? Sure. So homeschooling, you know, here we're talking about uh, students who aren't in the regular public school system or private school system, that they're uh, homeschooled by their parents or a pod, something like that. Um, you know, and often those parents think, oh, you know, I need my children to be, you know, socialized and, and be with more kids. And what's great about coming to a community music school is they are seeing other students that are working on music as well. They get to interact with them, make music with them. Um, what else also is great about homeschooling is typically they're on their own schedule. You know, our busiest hours are the typical after school hours, 3.30 p.m. till 8 p.m. on weekdays. And homeschoolers, maybe they don't want to drive in downtown traffic. 
uh, during those hours so they can come to lessons at lunchtime. Right. right. Uh, uh, we only have about a minute or two left. Um, and you said you have a summer promotion? Yes. Yeah, so uh, music lessons all summer. That's uh, eight weeks of 30-minute lessons uh, for only $399. So it's a great deal. Many parents are looking to get their kids off screens and engaged and active for the summer. And music lessons are a fantastic opportunity for the summer to keep those skills up and sharp. Again, it's only $399 for music lessons all summer. I know other um, camps that uh, parents are looking to sign their children up for can cost hundreds, if not thousands, for one single week. And this is $399 for the entire summer. So it's a great deal. Just call our office team. Our phone number is 914-698-1500. And we can get you set up on summer music lessons and get you started next week. And also one of the advantages is it gives you a chance to test out uh, whether or not music is uh, is something your child really would appreciate, and it gives a child the ability of doing something constructive during the summer break when their minds are not as busy as um, you know as they are during the school year. Sometimes kids just fall backwards because there's no um, discipline. One hundred percent. Music lessons keep that discipline up, keep the mind active. So when school season rolls around again in September, those students are ready to go. We also have a lot of students, as you were mentioning before, who are in the school orchestra or band, or they're going to be starting it this coming September, and they'll start lessons with us in the summer to get a two-month head start on those instruments so that as their school workload does start to get busier in September and October, you know, music is um, a little bit easier for them because they already have some starting background. That is really great. I really appreciate the fact that you took so much time today uh, and I learned a lot, and um, I definitely uh, think that people should um, consider um, music for uh, their for, for their kids. And um, um, Pauline Mosley, my co-host, uh, recommends the Harrison uh, uh, School of Music. Uh, um, and you know, again, your book, The Definitive Guide to Music Lessons: Everything You Need to Know About Learning a New Instrument, by Sam. Verace um, is good reading and will be helpful to a lot of parents. So I'm Paul Feiner, Greenberg Town Supervisor, and I'll see everybody next week.